everybody. Welcome to FEI Freight Executive Insights. As always, I am not the executive with the insights, but I do have one here. His name is Scott Elder, and he's founder, CEO, and president of a company. And it's and it's just coincidental that it has the exact same name, Elder Logistics, right? I mean, you didn't plan that. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks for being on the show, man. What's going on, brother? Oh, uh, you know, not much. I mean, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, getting my arms around things on on the day off. You know, being in my yeah. role, you kind of you kind of never can be mentally off a hundred percent. You know, it's it can be kind of right, tough, especially in with how things are going as of late. You know, I mean, it's no secret. So, yeah, no, you feel you 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 have to put in some effort every single day. Right. I mean, you have to. And it's just me, too. Is that a is that a and we'll get into all that kind of stuff. Tell us about you. Tell us about Elder. Who is Elder Logistics and why should people care about Elder Logistics? What do you guys do? Well, I, I don't know why they should care about it, but we'll, we'll leave that up to their determination. So okay. what do we do as a company? We are a, uh, a company that employs around 200 to 215 people, depending on you know how busy the season is or not. And yeah. um, we are a full service uh, trucking and logistics uh, company that you know kind of operates in four or five different silos. Um, a lot of companies our size would be, you know, uh, strictly a dry van OTR company or maybe an OTR company that that runs a, a couple different equipment types. But yeah. we actually have um, we we have some condos, you know, we definitely run about I would say about 20 condos. We have, uh, you know, a slew of day cabs, a few class B trucks and uh, a whole little army of class C non CDL box trucks. And um, we also have uh, five locations that we actually, you know, run operations out of. We're, oh, uh, where, where is that region at? Um, so right now I'm sitting in our, our uh, little corporate office in downtown Puyallup, Washington. It's one of those places where you'll never be able to pronounce it right unless you're from here, right? Isn't and, it? I thought it was pronounced Payallop. Yeah, <laughs> uh, everyone does. No worries. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's coincidentally the, the city where I live and our terminal in the area used to also be in Puyallup just down the street, but um, kind of uh, outgrew that and the situation changed there with a the sublease. So it was time to move. And so our, our building up here is in Tacoma in the what we call the Tide Flats area, which is where the port is. All the huge yeah. ships get, uh, you know, the containers loaded and unloaded and so on and so forth. And we also have a uh, terminal in Portland, Oregon, uh, down on Swan Island. Uh, we're, okay. in, we're in Reno, Nevada, uh, you know, right next to the, the, the elbow of 80 and 580. And um, we're also, we have a, a, a terminal in Salt Lake City, which we've recently opened up, as well as a small, uh, it, it, it'll seem non sequitur, but it makes sense for one of our silos, a small consolidation operation in Morganton, North Carolina, where we consolidate LTL loads of furniture. Oh, and just and, and then skip yeah, it out to the right. PNW and then distribute through the PNW. No, that makes perfect sense. Now, yeah, to be our a, buildings. Yeah. 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 No, that's a perfect setup. I, I did um, floor covering uh, at X, Express Global Systems. We we had warehouses all over the country. We did just did floor covering. So it, it, and most of that comes out of Northwest Georgia, if you don't know. And most people, you know, if you've bought any furniture and figured out the secret, it all comes from the Carolinas. <laughs> so, well, all the, all, the or, expen- or, all, all the expensive furniture. Now all the like expen- that. Yeah, the expensive <laughs> stuff. Ikea is not coming from North Carolina, but no. yeah, no, the expensive stuff is for sure. But it lends itself to a lot of um, what I, we used to zone skipping type of stuff, pool distribution type of thing and stuff, because it's, it's LTL shipments that do not fit in LTL. You don't want to be shipping furniture through LTL. It's just a bad move, right? No, and they, they, and they don't want it. As a matter of fact, we, we also work with pretty much all of the big nine and then some LTL wise in some way, shape or form in one of our markets or another, right? So whether it's overflow or kind of interline beyond point work, you know, that's really uh, the crux of what we do in Reno, for instance, 
You yeah. Know? Nobody knows Elko more than us. Yeah, I mean, you're doing all the so you're doing all the you're doing all the uh, the uh, the dash codes LTL. You know, you'd have like your terminals like number like two hundred four was mine and one of mine in L two, and you had two hundred four, two hundred four dash one dash two dash three dash four. Those second, third, fifth day service locations, cartage type of stuff. You do a lot of that type of stuff. Oh, it, well, yeah, especially out of Reno. I mean, and as a matter of fact, you know, I'll, I'll uh, I'm, we're pretty prideful of this. Like uh, Reno, uh, Elko and Winnemucca and Battle Mountain and all that stuff. That's like a next day point for us. You know, oh, wow. we we're there every day, you know. And I mean, especially you can imagine now with all the mining that's taking place in northern Nevada. That's a huge oh, deal. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's all about that density. Right. So that's where you guys kind of fit in. And when I when I look at or, or look at, but, you know, you I picture the, the combination of where you guys are located. Right. And then the equipment that you guys have. It's fairly obvious that that I mean, with your size, where you're located in a different part, you can consolidate and get that density of different types of shipments that don't quite fit into the other stuff. Right. Is that kind of what we're looking at here? Is that that's not the official business plan, but it sure sounds like it. Yeah, it's definitely one of our things. So we we also do we have a division where we just flat out run over the road trucks, too. And okay. um, and, and really. So the interesting thing is we do not substantially connect line haul between our terminals. It's we don't really go looking for base customer LTL you know, shippers, because, frankly, all of our customers do such a good job of, of you know, having giant black books of business. You take any of the big nine and they have a customer list of 35,000 shippers. Like, you know, it would yeah. take me, you know, 15 lifetimes to get to that point, you know? So, sure. and, and especially in a, in a consolidated area, but we, the one thing, the interesting perspective we have with the LTL side is we see how all of them operate intrinsically, right? Like we're, I mean, you could, we're, we're kind of their, their, their right hand guys. You know, we try to add value to them too, to, you know, help to try to help them as much as possible, you know, stay efficient and stay current, you know, but it's interesting how they all approach business a little differently, you know, in, in that realm. And then as far as the furniture consolidation, to your point about weird freight fitting in that becomes our choke point is really training our dock staff to appropriately load furniture with some general freight because um the within the furniture realm no one again no one will hit the beyond points better than us like when we when we have trucks in port angeles washington every day and if you look at the siloed furniture only stop truck type carriers um, it used to be they would have terminals in the area, but they don't anymore. Um, those guys are going to take weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to get to Port Angeles just because there's not density. But, you know, we work with some LTLs that give us business out there and um, and there's a Home Depot out there. So we're going to be there every day and we just add the furniture and, you know, deal with the choke point of, or the pain point, I should say, of teaching the dock staff how to secure and load that freight you know, with, with a little bit more caution to, to where they understand how it needs to move appropriately. Yeah. Yeah. That incremental freight can be great. And, and the, you, what you've done is really that choke point has caused you to be an expert in moving, moving furniture. Right. I mean, and that, and that's what they're looking for is that the furniture haulers, right. Or the furniture companies for delivery is getting it across in a, in a, in a dry van, a single truckload, and then that expertise at the other end of, of breaking it down and not to dwell on the furniture too much, but I mean, that's pretty much your business model across the board. And then you have some, you have some other, uh, uh, you got a significant, just straight up dry van long haul moves, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we kind of, I would say we run like Western five or six with that. Okay, cool. um, we have some part, like uh, we have a partnership with a Canadian carrier out of Ontario where we, we uh, consolidate and build loads here in Tacoma and Portland and then um, send our OTR guys just, you know, to a to a predetermined middle of the country location and meet them with their loads, swap boxes and go back and then and then blow it out and rinse and repeat. So we we do a yeah. little bit of that, too, um, with our with our OTR crew. So it kind of is self-serving. And that's that's definitely more of the realm I would like to get into because we can't we do have the ability to pick up a truckload of stuff 
take it to Tacoma and then deliver it en masse to residentials, you know, which is, it's kind of unusual for people, you know, in our, our realm to be able to do that. So that's definitely one of our sales point that, and we do do a little bit of flat out retail pool distribution too. I heard you mention right. that. Yeah. Retail pool. That's, that's cool. Do you do any, you do any uh, uh, breaking down inside the case or just straight up full breaking down pallets type of distribution in the pool distribution? It varies. So um, one okay. of our customers comes in pre palletized black wrapped. It's pretty high value per, per pallet. And so we don't really mess with it. It really just behaves like hyper time critical appointment wise LTL. You know, yeah. and that comes in every day and we make it work. And if you have a wife or a daughter, they've heard of the company, I'm sure, you know, but I got you. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. and then we we actually have another account that uh, that deals with a, a passion that it looks like both you and I have based on looking behind you. So, yeah, I was, you know, I, I was going to say we, we can get into if you're if you're hauling for this particular industry of 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 music, but I, I was going to say, you know, in, in my career, I've, I've run across a lot of beards, and and usually when I see one of this magnitude of this beauty, it is it's associated with it has to be number one trucking or or music or both, and and yours is exuding the power of of both, right? Am I am I right there? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. So, what do you you? So, what do you play? You 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 like a Taylor Swift cover band? Is that what it is? No. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I actually. <laughs> I mean, however, you know, maybe maybe we can you know blues rockify a Taylor Swift song, or or you know, with my other band, turn it into a, a like a, a reggae song. Which so oh, you're, you're, oh, so you're a reggae man. I got my Marley right here, bro. So so yeah, I, I play I play in a. Um, in a reggae, just a, it's a real fun, you know, lighthearted band, uh, a, a reggae band called Get Lifted. I know it's hilarious, but um, and um, it's it's just a bunch of a bunch of, you know, great musicians. We don't honestly have a lot of time to rehearse. The singer and keyboard player is a pro. He plays like five nights a week in any empty corner of any establishment in the area. He's the busiest musician I've ever seen. You know, gotcha. and so it's just a matter of, OK, here's here's the lyrics and the key. And this is just a one four in G minor and let's roll. And it just becomes, you know, really on the funky side and just really has a nice, loose, jammy interplay feel to it. That's that band. And then I also play in an original rock band called Sons of the Force. And, All right. Okay. And um, it frankly... Uh, the best way I can describe it is it's definitely original, but it, it sounds like it could have happened in 1978. I, and, okay, so I, my, my immediate reaction was the gods. Remember the gods are rock and roll machines? The gods are rock and roll machines. And that's kind of when I heard Sons of the Force, I was like, okay, it's kind of like the gods are rock and roll. G-O-D-Z, the gods. It actually doesn't have anything to do with Star Wars. Everyone, even though it, we, we get invited to May the 4th gig. And it's a reference to the drummer of the band's dad's nickname. He and he was his nickname was what the Force. His, his nickname was the Force because okay he was kind of a surly old dude. Back when we were kids, we would rehearse at his house, and we would never pick up after ourselves. And so you know his he, he used to make speaker enclosures, and his little brand was called Gale Force. You know, because oh, nice. pushing cool. wind. And so yeah. our nickname of his was The Force, you know, because he would come in and just kind of lose his mind because we were 18-year-olds that didn't know how to roll chords up, you know. And and so when we started a band in our adulthood, we decided to call it Sons of the Force, you know. Yeah, no, I, I love it. Was he like the Red Foreman of the of the group? <laughs> a, a little bit, but he was he was Red Foreman that could play a pretty mean Chuck Berry lick. So, I mean, oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Uh-huh. I love it, man. I, I, lo I love, we'll have to jam sometime, man. Yeah. So, um, there's a, a, a <laughs> my very good friend, John Brewer, who is head of logistics for, uh, CKR restaurants. All right. <laughs> uh, like Carl's and Hardy's and all that other kind of mm -hmm. stuff. He, said. he, um, he writes the lyrics for parody songs and I do all the music and, and, and singing behind him. We produce different songs like the, you know, all trucking tunes, right? So 
I mean, instead awesome. of one love, it's we did one load instead of one love from Bob Marley, that type of stuff. It's fun stuff. So let me ask you this. Coming through into present day, right? I mean, you guys have been around for a while and you've navigated the turbulent times of the last five years, right? <laughs> Which we're still trying to get through. How, how did you guys fare? Is your 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 variety of services and, and capacity, was that key to making it through to this side? And if so, what, what, what sides of it fared the best or are doing the best right now? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's interesting because I would say until, and it's really based on the market too, because we are kind of market specific with our LTL operations. I mean, I would definitely say LTL has been more resilient than anything else, you know, going into it, but there still has been a, um, there still has been some softness in the Pacific Northwest recently with, with our LTL customers, you know, whereas in, in Reno, there's not, you know, there's. Okay, so it's kind of spotty. It's, it's spotty there, right? Yeah, it is. It is. And, and I, I mean, I'll say it's one of the more difficult times I've been in trucking my entire adult life. I mean, before elder logistics, I had, was a sole proprietor that delivered furniture for what became Macy's up here. And, okay. uh, you know, and I bought my first truck um, from this old retired drunk contractor. And it was a big heap that I had to start with a screwdriver. And, you know, I mean, it was a, just a classic Horatio Alger situation, you know, and I, I, I did that when I was 22 and did, you know, worked as a sole prop for about 12 years before I incorporated uh, I, I was made to incorporate by uh, FedEx Ground when I was operating there, delivering packages, and I just kind of kept the corporation going and grew it. You know, so I've been doing it more than half my life. Well, that's uh, awesome! Congratulations, dude. So the LTL now is feeling a little bit soft, though, right? It, it depends on the market. Uh, I'll say that the Pacific Northwest definitely does. I mean, I I think we can kind of blame maybe the the, the, the consumer being tapped out. I mean, it's a fairly expensive area, you know, yeah. with, with housing and certainly interest, interest rates aren't helping with that. You know, that that's obviously going to lend itself to a little bit of softness with furniture because, you know, people buy furniture when they buy a new house or move usually. Right. You know, you know, but um, on the other hand, Reno is doing really well. Portland is faring better, but that's more due to specific customers that we have in that market, and we don't really have substantially in, uh, in say, Tacoma. Gotcha. So it's the, depending on the industry, et cetera, it's there. So, um, yeah, but I mean, that is concerning. You know, you say with the interest rates, et, et cetera, and, you know, people buy furniture, et cetera, when, when they buy a new home or, or, when the interest rates and everything align where they can use their home as an ATM a little bit, right? To oh, refer. yeah. And, and it does seem like this year, maybe the average Joe got a little less of a tax return. And that normally juices general freight LTL too, you know, because that bigger items tend to cost a couple thousand bucks, right? And that's that's kind of when, you know, the, the homedepot.com shipping picks up through our, our partner, you know, our customer partner carriers. And it seems like it's, I know that, you know, it, weirdly, it was busier in, in February even than it is now, which is really unusual for LTO. But, um, I mean, we, we definitely have a, a pretty unique insight on the whole shakeout of the yellow situation, too, because we sure. worked for yellow and red away and also everyone that was a beneficiary of that. And... And it, the thing that surprised me a little bit, and I think it is a canary in the coal mine for how the economy is, is all of our all of our ROMs and higher at these LTLs that we work for. And again, I, I don't need to name names, but it's everyone that you know, right? Um, they they suspected that yellow going out of business, especially two or three of them, would cause like a a sort of COVID-like chaotic disruption for about six months. Well, the reality of the matter is the, the, the furniture got rearranged in about eight weeks, you know, and, and really everyone, I mean, certainly some of them are, are a little bit closer to capacity than others, but 
um, it, that was a little surprising that they were able to sort that out because we know how infrastructure heavy uh, LTL is. And it, it, yeah. if you back your line haul up for two days, it can take you a month to dig out of it. Yeah, no, it, it certainly can. So is, that's a, yeah. So is that a testimony to how light things have, have become this winter to just blow through that so quickly in eight weeks and get it straightened out? Because that is, and that's concerning, right? Because LTL, when it hits, starts going into a trough, now you're deep into a trough that's not going to turn around anytime real soon, right? Yeah. So, so here's kind of, we, we always kind of judge how strong the, the, the year is, uh, you know, based on when our kind of spike happens in the spring and we all, they're always, no matter what is an LTL spike. And usually if it's going to be say next week, the week after Memorial day usually does it to them because they lose a day of line hall essentially. And things, the backup is sort of baked in. It's it's a late year, and it is. So we're going to see how it is next week because that will be a big determiner of of where kind of the summer season goes for it. Yeah, yeah, because then you got the summer, and then you got the back to school fall type of stuff, and then you've got the rolling into the holidays, and we'll see how that that spike goes depending on this next one. I do think that though, on on kind of the the long term, I mean that's kind of the short term, but on, on the long term. As far as the overall capacity of the LTL system, if you kind of make an aggregate of all of the carriers, I think that they are definitely, they're definitely have the the ceiling of their capacity overall has been probably lowered by three or 4%. Because if you look at yellow going out of business, that was 9% of the landscape, right? And You know, then afterwards, there was, you know, certainly, obviously, the drivers are suddenly looking for a new place to go. But I don't think all of those drivers have been rehomed, you know, neatly back into other LTL carriers. I don't think by any stretch. And then you look at 250 plus facilities operating. And we can debate all day long about the, the how efficient they were. Or they weren't. That kind of doesn't matter. But the point is, is they were operating and now they're not. And then you you hear about the big LTLs talking of well we've we've expanded our terminal network by acquiring new buildings, but what we're really seeing is sort of more of a shell game than a pure expansion, right? Like like you look at down in Portland, um, you know uh, I know that XPO is moving to the old Redaway building, which is a, it's the biggest building in Portland by far, but they're they're not adding it in addition to their old building. Right. So uh, so and at, and at some point, if you you can you can get new, bigger buildings. But if you haven't replaced the manpower needed to run it, then the, then the overall capacity of it can't it has to be down. And so when when demand comes back, carriers like us will be needed more than ever, because, you know, it's it's sort of like you have you've shut one the equivalent of one container terminal down on the West Coast. And it's just not coming back unless somebody chooses to completely, you know, recruit all the way into it, you know, but that's a pretty big undertaking. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. So you're that needed capacity for that for that spike when it comes back and starts growing. That's excellent stuff. I really appreciate your insights on that, Scott. Um, Hey, where are people going to learn more and, and like book all of your extra capacity by the end of today? (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, you can, yeah, you can certainly, you can certainly find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm there. Uh, I would love to connect and I, I like chatting with people on there too. Um, our website is www.elderlogisticsinc.com. And, um, you know, if, if, there, if you're interested in working for us, we're, you know, like anyone else, we're, we're always looking for good drivers. You can apply on our website. Um, you can, uh, you can reach us. You can reach me through LinkedIn, you know, via message, and I'd be happy to share my email. Um, there's also links on our website for sales inquiries and so on and so forth. Fantastic. Hey, everybody, thank you for uh, tuning in to FEI Freight Executive Insights. And Scott, man, uh, I can't wait to talk to you again here soon. I'm going to follow up and find out how your week goes next week, right? Sounds great. <laughs> we'll, find, yeah, we'll find out where things are going. Peace and love, my friend. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it.